Welcome everybody to the online conference to save the earth is a human duty. My name is Raimondo Sini. I'm the director of Sustainable Development Foundation in Rome, and I am a member of Regenerative Society Foundation, and I'm very proud and happy to be the moderator of this online conference. We know there are many uh, connected people. We are very happy about that. This conference has been announced and has been also uh, part of some articles and, 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 and TV um, news. So we are very glad about this. And let me, before starting the conference, let me uh, tell you that I think that, you know, the casualty doesn't exist if, if we think, because there are some maybe subtle line between the events. For example, I think it's not a case that we have on the very same day today, the Earth Day 2022, and at the same time, the birthday of the Nobel laureate Rita Levi Montalcini. It may be casual, it may be not. So the idea is that there is a link between people, ideas, and goals and duties. This is the main uh, link of the conference. So I would like to tell you that this conference would like to deeper investigate um, all the issues about saving the earth, human duties, and also the role of companies and politics and people in this uh, mission. So this is a conference organized by the International Council of Human Duties and Regenerative Society Foundation in collaboration with Fondazione CL Trieste. And uh, uh, the, one of the links and one of the uh, important links that we've seen is that this year, 2022, is also something that is not casual. We are celebrating two anniversaries of two very important books, books that changed the word because they changed the perception of people in relation with the planet and with the earth and with nature. The first one is the Rachel Carson book, Silent Spring, that was uh, published 60 years ago. And it was very interesting because it's normally assumed that this book is the, uh, let's say, the first book on environmentalism, even if it's not a technical book. It's, 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 it's something open for the big public. And the second one is the 50th anniversary this year of the very important uh, book, Limits to Growth from the Club of Rome. And this changed completely uh, the, the perception also of the economists and, and the world in terms of sustainability. Everything started there 50 years ago. And now we see that we are online running for those goals. But already 50 years ago, uh, the destination was, was very clear. So um, I don't want to talk too much. I would like to give the floor to the speakers. But before uh, going into the details, before uh, presenting the speakers, uh, let me share with you uh, the principles uh, of the declaration that maybe we can simply read and open with this, the Trieste Declaration. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, uh, we can see with this, uh, we can start with this, our conference. The Trieste Declaration of Human Duties, a code of ethics of shared responsibilities. First principle, it is the duty of every human being to respect human dignity as well as ethnic, cultural, and religious diversity. Second, work against racial injustice and all discrimination of women and the abuse and exploitation of children. Third, work for improvement in the quality of life of aged and disabled persons. Fourth, respect human life and condemn the sale of human beings or parts of the living human body. Fifth, support efforts to improve the life of people suffering from hunger, misery, disease, or unemployment. Sixth, 
promote effective voluntary family planning in order to regulate world population growth. Seven, support actions for an equitable distribution of world resources. Eight, avoid energy waste and work for reduction of the use of fossil fuels. Promote the use of inexhaustible energy sources, representing a minimum on environmental and earth risks. Nine, protect nature from pollution and abuse. Promote conservation of natural resources and the restoration of degraded environments. 10, respect and preserve the genetic diversity of living organisms and promote constant scrutiny of the application of genetic technologies. 11, promote improvement of urban and rural regions and support endeavors to eliminate the causes of environmental destruction and impoverishment, which can lead to massive migrations of people and overpopulation in urban areas. 12, work for maintenance of war peace, condemn war, terrorism, and all other hostile activities by calling for decreased military spending in all countries and restriction of the proliferation and dissemination of arms, in particular, weapons of mass destruction. I think that these principles can resume really what should be the goal of human beings. And what I find very interesting is that to link this principle to duties of human beings that are equally important as rights and they help each other, duties and rights, they are not the opposite. They are the part of the same medal. I think this is a very, very important message. And of course, the, the final and the last principle about peace and what, how it is important to spend less for weapons and, and, and in general for, for um, um, activities related to wars. This is something that in these days is very important. But coming now to the uh, topic about the environment and saving the earth, uh, let me introduce you about the speakers uh, of the of the conference. So I will ask to show uh, if it's possible to show the program. And I'm very proud and honored to have with us uh, a panel of exceptional speakers. The first one will be Joan Fox Pesoski. Um, she is a, a member of the uh, the board of International Council of Human Duties and also board of directors of Environmental Integrity Project, former chair of Green Seals. At Shield, she cooperated with UNEP and with many environmental projects. And she will start talking about the shared responsibility for the future of the Earth in this particular day uh, of, uh, of the Earth Day. Uh, Johan will be followed by uh, Andrea Illy, the chair of Illy Cafe and the co chair of Regenerative Society Foundation. Um, and she will tell, and he will tell us about the uh, model from an extractive model to a regenerative social economic model, how the regeneration and the regeneration model can change the balance towards sustainability. After Andrea, we will have Paolo Vinais, the chair of environmental epidemiology, Imperial College in London, and also the scientific director of our Regenerative Society Foundation. And he will create a link between human health and the planet and how the planet and human health are, are linked and can help each other or can destroy each other if we don't do our duties. Uh, after Paolo, we will have Roberto Scalciglia, who was a former professor of comparative law, and he, will and he will tell us about how protecting the environment is part of the moral duty, but also legal principles. Then we will have a presentation by Piera, Levi Montalcini, the president of the Associazione Levi Montalcini, and the responsibility that Rita Levi Montalcini had towards the younger generations. And this is also very important, you know, to, 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 to pass, to be a witness from the generation to generation and to give the duties from one to another. And then I will ask Sergio Paletti, the president of International Council of Human Duties, to do um, uh, the, the final conclusions of, the, of this conference. 
Let me tell you, this is not a conference that ends in itself. This opens up uh, a, a road that we can uh, go together, that we can do together for the next months. So if you have ideas, if you have proposals, if you have comments, please feel free uh, to send it to International Council of Human Duties and Regenerative Society Foundation, because we may have some follow up with one of your, your maybe after one of your comments, ideas, and proposals. Um, so uh, let's start uh, with the conference. Let's start with Johan Fox Przewalski. Uh, let me ask the speakers uh, to have an intervention about, about 11, 12 minutes so that we may have a second round uh, with direct questions to all of you. So Johan, the floor is yours. Uh, sorry, please, can you put your mic on? My apologies. I'm delighted to be with you today to celebrate all these milestones and especially the birthday anniversary of Dr. Rita Levin-Montaccini, whose vision and humanity gave us the Trieste document, Declaration of Human Duties. In her 1991 magisterial lecture at the University of Trieste, Dr. Levi Montecini explained why a document of shared responsibilities was needed to accompany major historical documents, such as the US Constitution and Bill of Rights, the French Rights of Man and Citizens, and the UN Charter. She pointed out that each document protects rights, but does not explicitly mention what document, what duties are incumbent on us all. What led her to correct this omission was the threat of nuclear power with worldwide consequences, and also her recognition that other potentially disastrous threats could undermine, if not destroy, all living things on the planet. We've just been given the latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change with its alarming conclusion that the 2050 target to reduce carbon emissions, that the window is closing more rapidly predicted. In other words, the consequences from climate change may be outpacing our ability to adapt. And this appears sooner than expected. Given uh, sorry, sorry, we are not listening you now. Can you turn on the mic? Thank you. We know what has to happen. So let's consider the most feasible actions the low hanging fruit, so to speak, that could produce tangible results in the near term. Here are actions in four areas that could propel us faster to a green economy and sustainable development. The first area is remove perverse subsidies. As one media headline ruefully noted, research prompts warnings that humanity is financing its own extinction through subsidy, subsidies damaging to the climate, wildlife, and natural resources. The world spends more than $1 trillion a year on subsidies to timber and agricultural production that harms the environment. About $500 billion subsidizes fossil fuel industries. Instead, subsidies could be directed to make more available existing technologies such as wind, solar, heat pumps, and electric vehicles. These subsidies could go to such uh, facilities burning clean hydrogen fuel to sustainable biofuel that doesn't displace food sources and to increasing the infrastructure capacity of the energy grid. So remove perverse subsidies. The second area is to align public and private financing flows with sustainable development goals. 
banks and insurance companies can make a difference using sustainable development objectives to guide loans and underwriting. Stock exchanges also have a key role in greening capital, global capital markets. Importantly, participating countries, companies must commit to transparency and accountability through public reporting. A number of positive initiatives in the financial world have been taken over the past 10 years. Uh, a couple of examples in 2019, the banks that committed to the UN principles of responsible banking comprised one third of the banking sector and represented 40% of global banking assets. In 2021, the Net Zero Alliance was announced by UNIP and seven of the world's leading insurers, including Allianz, AXA, Swiss Re, Munich Re, et cetera. And the Sustainable Global Stock Exchanges Initiative, another UN partnership, brings together nearly all stock exchanges in the world, including Borsa Italiana, NASDAQ, and the stock exchanges in New York and London. In 2021, Environment, social, and governance mandates covered nearly 40% of globally managed assets of about $46 trillion. There have been other positive initiatives that include foreign direct investment, debt relief, debt swaps or nature, and concessional fining. And it's been done. International cooperation on closing the ozone hole rapidly mobilized loans, and technical and financial assistance to phase out ozone depleting substances. The third area, restructure government and business operations. Governments and companies are working to restructure their supply chains, produce materials more sustainably and reduce dependence on risky foreign sources while increasing their capacity for clean energy production. Yes, the international community is scrambling right now to uh, reduce imports from Russia. So we will see initial increases in fossil fuel production. But at the same time, governments and businesses have realized how urgently investments must be directed to reducing greenhouse gases, to supporting renewable energy and, required in, and its required infrastructure. The Global Methane Pledge, signed this month by 110 countries, is attacking methane emissions, a major component of natural gas, and initially 80 times more heat trapping than CO2. It's also the most quickly treatable greenhouse gas, and technologies to do this already exist. Last year, 38% of world's energy came from clean sources, wind, solar, hydro, and nuclear. Renewable energy has not only become more affordable in most places, it is now cheaper than new fossil fuels. If this growth continues at 20% each year to 2030, the global climate targets will be met. The World Council on Sustainable Development with CEOs of 200 leading companies just announced its vision 2050 with the title, A Time to Transform, to Restructure, to Reinvent Capitalism, to Reward True Value Creation. This is in response to the climate emergency, nature loss and mounting inequality. And Ili Kafe, as we will soon hear, is engaging a wide range of stakeholders to reimagine a socioeconomic model that represents a paradigm shift toward bio-driven sustainability. The fourth area is to engage the talents and energies of all populations. They must all be enabled and fully engaged. Youth, the photo of a 15-year-old girl sitting outside the parliament, Swedish parliament on a chilly April day in 2018, brought a smile to many, but who would have thought that her solitary protest would soon become a worldwide cry? Youths believe that the older generations have failed them and they demand action. 
They are now officially represented at in various international fora, such as the UN Environmental Assembly, where they call for action now and serve as an ever present conscience for the rights of future generations. People of all ages need to listen to them and take actions to safeguard their future and the generations in follow, that follow. Women in the LGBTQ communities must be fully engaged. Here we are, already well into the 21st century, yet in many countries, women remain outside the talent pool. They are not able to fully participate in their societies. The roles are assigned to them rather than voluntarily chosen. Imagine if Greta Thunberg had been born in Afghanistan, where girls and that is returning girls and women to the environment of 30 years ago. Imagine if Wangari Mathar, the founder of the green movement that plants trees across Kenya, had lived in one of 30 countries that restrict women's freedom of movement. Imagine if Jen Goodall had lived in one of 18 countries that require women to obtain their husband's permission to work outside the house. And imagine if Rosa Macario, former president and CEO of Patagonia who oversaw the protection of millions of hectares of land were living in one of 69 countries where homosexuality is a criminal offense. Yes, all populations must be enabled and fully engaged, including the poorest and disadvantaged among us. The reality today is that while the personal incomes have decreased between richer and poorer countries, income disparities have increased within countries. And this is why attention must be given to all 12 duties expressed in the, declaration, the Trieste Declaration. Unless the well being of the poorest and most disadvantaged populations is improved, the pressures for food and livelihoods will continue. And these pressures will erode even the best protections for our planet and life as we know it. I'll conclude by restating not everything is possible for immediate action, so we have to prioritize. The areas I've mentioned seem the most feasible for results in the near term. Remove fossil fuel subsidies, align financing with sustainable development goals, restructure, re-envision government and business operations, and enable and engage the talents of all peoples. Our Common Future, the 1987 report by the World Commission on Environment and Development, defined for the first time sustainable development and noted its promise. However, without a total commitment to addressing the climate, con climate emergency, there can be no conversation about sustainable development. Today, after more than 35 years of international agreements, the targets, the solutions are clear. We have the roadmap. And thanks to the vision of Dr. Rita Levi-Montaccini, we have the Trieste Declaration of Human Duties, our moral compass to guide us on that road to a fairer and livable world. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne, for, the, Joanne, for this excellent um, first speech and presentation, because I think you define very clearly the, the, the big drivers that we should uh, focus upon and also you made me think about what how duties are important and which is you know there is an Indian word called dharma dharma means at the same time duty and law and many other things so it seems from your presentation that the dharma and the duty of our human beings now towards the earth is very clear and things are clear we just need to do to do them. So in your presentation, in one of the, uh, the four points, um, you said about restructuring government and companies uh, and reinvent capitalism and paradigm shift. Uh, I think this is an excellent link to Andrea Illis, um, 
presentation because I think Andrea is the demonstration that the Dharma and the duty of uh, managers and companies are not only linked to uh, the economic value and the shareholders and the jobs, but there are other duties and Dharma as, as important as those ones. Andrea, can you please tell us about this idea of the regeneration that also led you as an entrepreneur, as a manager, to create also a foundation like Regenerative Society Foundation? Please, Andrea. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. Such an important occasion. Thank you, Raimondo, for introducing me. Um, I will try to do my best in explaining our view. Uh, first of all, the statement. Uh, we need an ecological transition. Uh, why do we need an ecological transition? Because our current so-called extractive uh, model is uh, uh, structurally uh, unsustainable. We are now living in a systemic crisis, environmental, health, uh, sanitary, sorry, uh, social, economical, military. This proves how unsustainable is our model. Our model is unsustainable because it not only keeps depleting planetary resources without never restoring them, but most importantly, it produces an infinite amount of residues polluting the environment. But which is more is that uh, these residues accumulate and the accumulation of these residues is suffocating the biosphere, which is responsible for our life. So the idea of the regenerative model is, let's try to pursue a model organized like mother nature is organized. Mother nature for each uh, biosynthetic uh, process has a reversed one, biodegradation, and the two feeds each other in a perfect balance with no residues, no imbalances, and cells adapting since 3.6 billion years. So we have a lot to learn from that. And uh, how to uh, apply this uh, regenerative model. So uh, the Regenerative uh, Society Foundation, which uh, I have the privilege to co-chair together with Jeffrey Sachs, spent the last 12 months in uh, figuring out uh, a framework. So the framework is made of uh, three macro uh, factors. The very first one is people's well-being, uh, intended as health and happiness both together. The second macro factor is a circularity, circular economy intended as less uh, reduced resource depletion and zero residues. And last but not least, the third macro factor is the biosphere, particularly in the two most important components, uh, the carbon stock, because the only machine in place for fixing the uh, greenhouse gases from the air into a solid state still is the photosynthesis with a net primary production. And the second component of the biosphere is biodiversity. Biodiversity, which is responsible for the food chains, is responsible also for ecosystems, uh, <clears throat> health and resilience. So these are interaction between these three macro factors, which are all uh, complex adaptive systems. So they uh, attempt the endeavor to uh, analyze the interaction between these so uh, complex, uh, uh, let's say systems is of course manageable only with the so-called systemic approach. Reductionism is one of the big danger in trying to address sustainability because you might either uh, uh, make a wrong model because the system is not linear. It cannot be studied with algebra. It needs a different kind of uh, system. 
and uh, we also might uh, uh, generate damages in other systems if you uh, use a re reductionist approach, uh, trying to address one thing uh, at a time, like we are doing now with the energy transition. Energy transition we, is a prerequisite for uh, the ecological transition, but not necessarily the uh, technologies that we are developing now for the energy transition are regenerative themselves. So we might find ourselves with another problem a few decades or centuries down the road. This is why the regenerative model uh, needs to address as a fundamental objective is the spontaneous regeneration of the biosphere. Biospheres, which is made, is, is the living part uh, of uh, the natural capital. The non-living part would be the geosphere. Uh, the, bio, uh, the biosphere is divided in terrestrial and water and is made of ecosystems. All these ecosystems, <clears throat> they uh, regenerate spontaneously. And this is the reason of their resilience they would not have problems in re, uh, regenerating themselves should uh, uh, humankind disappear from earth. In just few decades, uh, we would be totally regenerated as a biosphere. So the problem is for the social, and we go back to square one, uh, for the social condition of people sustaining growth. Growth is biological, is how system works. So you refer the, to <clears throat> the limit to growth is the best possible explanation I found about how systems works. So I think that growth eventually is originated by nature, by the cellular division, which divides uh, two, four, six, uh, eight, 16, 32, exponentially. This is the, the way nature works. And as a consequence of this exponential growth of uh, uh, the biosphere, all the rest uh, is following the same path, including demography, including economy. So we have to keep growing for staying alive because the opposite of growth would be exponential decrease. Because uh, you know, if the base is higher than one, then you have exponential growth is the base is a lower than one, then you have exponential decrease, which would be uh, halving human population, halving the economy and creating an even more unsustainable system uh, in, uh, in a few years. So our idea in uh, this uh, ecological transition from extractive to regenerative is that, uh, of course, we need to engage all stakeholders, of course, we need to engage citizens because they are the very one first actor with their behavior and consumption a pattern in, uh, uh, let's say, uh, triggering the transition. Of course, we need to involve politics for uh, regulations. Of course, we need uh, to involve the finer investors in order for them to invest uh, selectively in uh, sustainable investments. But as a matter of fact, would we have a magic stick in our hand, we would change all businesses. And for the simple reason that civilization, whatever surrounds us is made by businesses, million and million and million businesses, which not only have the critical mass of over two thirds of the world GDP, two thirds of the employment, at least two thirds of the innovation, whichever contributor to uh, development is uh, created, is uh, triggered by businesses. So businesses are now perfectly aware that they need to uh, accomplish these uh, ecological transitions. Also, because if they don't, they uh, have to face uh, terrible threats. And if they do, they will be able to do, they will uh, uh, have terrific opportunities like increasing the value of their business and also have a reputational premium and of course being much long lasting uh, businesses. However, businesses don't know now how to make this ecological transition. 
So we are like uh, in phase of a new era, like the CIT era has been. At the origin of the CIT revolution, there were only two uh, assets. One was a computer and second was the web. If, if you remember when the web uh, started, it was like having just a, a, a little kind of cable. And now we have million, million, a million different possible applications, uh, which are, uh, are uh, the con uh, a consequence of this uh, structural uh, capacity of uh, connecting people and things all over the world. Well, we are facing a similar era where we know that we have to go green. We know that we have to go for a regenerative uh, model. We still don't know how, we still don't know which will be the specific applications, but it, uh, it, it is triggering an enormous revolution. Just to, to give you uh, an idea how real it can be, um, of course, uh, uh, let's say businesses are divided in two, those who consume uh, organic resources, and for those, uh, you have to go regenerative. Uh, the remainder part, which are comp businesses consuming mineral resources, then for them, you go circular and make sure that uh, you don't extract uh, uh, fresh resources and you continue to recycle the ones which have been already extracted and you have no waste in the environment. So this uh, gives you an idea about how many possible sectors are involved in this regenerative model from regenerative agriculture environmental services, uh, regenerative, uh, urban regeneration, uh, uh, bioarchitecture, green chemistry, um, you know, this emerging uh, synthetic biology, producing, generating new species for specific tasks uh, and whichever of circular ma uh, material and so on and so forth. So thank you so much. Uh, I, I hope I was able to give you a, a view, which is also practical of how we can make it and uh, how to make it. Thanks very much, Andrea. You, you gave us a very clear view and also you made me think about many questions I would like to, to make to you about. And I, I found a very good and very interesting, the idea of the growth and the degrowth, because sometimes this is uh, misunderstood by people. So what is real growth and what are the limits to growth and what is the sustainable growth and the regenerative growth and, and why decrease can be not the answer sometimes and can be uh, dangerous. Uh, and how can we measure all of this with which indicators? So you open up many uh, good points, maybe for the future and for the next uh, conference in a webinar, and I'm sure that uh, the next speaker, Paolo Vinais, can also open up some new horizons because Paolo uh, will try and make a link between the one health for the humans and the planet. And this is another topic that is not being explored that much, um, uh, especially by the public opinion and the policymakers. So I know Paolo is very difficult to to do this in 15 minutes or 12, 30 minutes, but now we challenge you. Let's see. Uh, thank you very much, Raimondo. Yes, I will try to do that uh, with the help of some slides, uh, which are usually more effective in showing what uh, I want to say. So um, I have uh, essentially two points. Uh, the first point is that uh, uh, the extent of uh, uh, degradation of the environment uh, is uh, uh, still unexplored uh, and uh, it is probably uh, bigger than we thought. You mentioned uh, uh, Rachel Carson and uh, she uh, foresaw uh, many of the problems we, we now observe. This is a slide coming from a, a very recent paper by a person who works in, uh, in the Potsdam Center. Um, the slide refers to the famous uh, approach used by Rockstrom and the Stockholm Resilience Center of the nine uh, uh, sectors of the planet, uh, where they, they suggested to quantify the planetary boundaries. And uh, um, this uh, particular slide refers to novel entities, what they call novel entities, which includes, uh, uh, for example, plastics, uh, microplastics, nanoplastics, uh, but also antibiotics, chemicals. 
Well, the, the purpose of uh, this uh, approach uh, based on the different uh, sectors of the planet uh, is that uh, we, sh we are not supposed to cross uh, those boundaries because otherwise the situation may become irreversible, which is uh, something we are very close to with climate change uh, and uh, other threats to, um, to the planet. So in this particular case, uh, uh, there is another uh, very telling slide in the paper, which is about uh, the growth of, of chemical pollution in the world. Um, as you see from 2000 to 2017 around, there has been a, an enormous increase uh, in the production capacity of chemicals, including plastics, including pesticides. Uh, uh, I'm particularly concerned about antibiotics because of the antibiotic resistance. Um, so this is a big challenge. And, and one of the main points of a person's paper is that uh, uh, only for a small minority of these chemicals, we have toxicological data. Uh, and uh, the attention has been drawn uh, to effects uh, uh, to humans uh, uh, through toxicological tests, uh, not so much uh, uh, to the effects on the environment. And this is uh, particularly uh, concerning. Then, um, as uh, Raimondo said, uh, the second point I, I want to make is about health, because the, there is a strong link uh, between uh, uh, what we are saying and health. Um, this uh, has been raised uh, by Rachel Carson many years ago, and now we know much more. For example, this is uh, the number of deaths uh, attributable to air pollution every year in the world. It, it is likely to be an underestimate, uh, 4.5 million deaths. Um, and air pollution is uh, important uh, not only because uh, uh, it leads to diseases and premature death, uh, particularly in low-income countries, but also because uh, it contributes uh, to climate change. Uh, so we have a, a huge problem with uh, uh, transportation, with heating, the use of coal, uh, uh, particularly in low-income countries, which uh, both lead uh, to uh, climate change and uh, uh, a burden in terms of uh, um, diseases and, and deaths. But this is also true for uh, uh, nutrition and agriculture. This is a um, research we have done uh, at Imperial College. Uh, it, it comes from a large population of about a half a million people in Europe, um, in which we investigated uh, uh, diet and health in the course of time. We, we collected uh, uh, much information about dietary habits uh, in the early 90s. And then we followed up these people uh, for about 20 years. We also have uh, blood samples uh, from them. Um, on the upper uh, part of, of the slide, uh, you see bars, uh, which uh, uh, represent uh, what happens if you shift from uh, a, a bad diet to a, a good diet. This is a proportion of deaths that you could uh, avoid uh, by shifting from a good diet, um, sorry, from a bad diet, uh, according to the Eat Lancet Commission, to um, a good diet, where good and bad uh, refers to good for your health or bad for your health and bad is for example a high intake of red meat but also to um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions so the, this uh, eat lancet commission was probably the first to um, produce and, and promote uh, um, uh, dietary recommendations which uh, refer both to health and to uh, mitigation of climate change and in fact the two lines the red and the blue lines uh, reflect uh, the decrease in greenhouse uh, gas emissions uh, uh, going from a uh, bad diet to a, a good diet. So uh, as you see, you have a double benefit in terms of health and uh, planetary health, human health and planetary health. If you uh, reduce your uh, red meat intake uh, and you increase uh, legumes, uh, uh, vegetables and, and, and fruit, in your uh, diet. Um, I also refer to biodiversity because, uh, uh, well, erosion of biodiversity is another um, uh, huge problem. It is a reality. It is uh, probably accelerating and uh, it has an impact on uh, uh, our health. Um, 
for example, as far as epidemics and pandemics are, are concerned. Uh, on the right, you see a slide from uh, Morens and Fauci, uh, the, the well-known uh, uh, US virologist. And uh, it shows the emerging and re-emerging uh, infectious diseases uh, um, between uh, 1980, I believe, and 1981, and uh, um, 2000 something. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, to 2000, in fact, uh, 19. Um, and there is, a, a, in a way, a new pandemic era, according to, uh, to Morens. And pandemics are very much related to environmental degradation. They are related to deforestation, like what happens in uh, Amazon. Um, they are related to um, animal breeding, big animal farms, uh, and once again, uh, to the uh, dietary habits, uh, like uh, excessive intake of uh, red meat, which is increasing in uh, uh, middle income and uh, low income countries, uh, it is uh, stable in, in high income countries. Um, yeah. Sorry, uh, the slides do not proceed <laughs> for some reason. Well, uh, the slides are stuck, but uh, uh, yes, this scusi, was... Dr. Vinais, provi a entrare proprio all'interno del programma di PowerPoint a riselezionare la finestra. Entrare nel programma, aspetti, forse sono riuscito. Ok, eh. ok, I made it. Sorry. Uh, so, I want to make a, a final point, uh, in a way, that is, uh, we have to change uh, the, the view we look at uh, energy. Well... We, the way we look at many things uh, in our lifestyle, but this uh, um, uh, reference to energy is interesting because uh, when people talk about energy, and this has become uh, dramatic now because of, of the war, as we all know, they just refer to uh, efficiency uh, in uh, extracting, for example, uh, fossil fuels uh, in relation to the energy that becomes available to citizens. Um, uh, there is a, uh, an index uh, which is called uh, EROI, which is essentially the difference between the energy which is needed uh, uh, to extract uh, uh, some uh, uh, fuel, for example, and uh, the energy produced uh, by, by that uh, source. Now, um, the success of uh, fossil fuels uh, is related to the fact that uh, the difference was very little. Uh, it, 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 extracting uh, oil uh, required uh, very little energy and you got a lot of energy available for the population. But now this is no longer true. Uh, extracting oil is becoming ex extremely expensive in, and it requires more and more energy. The problem here is not only that you have to put into the equation uh, how much energy you need uh, to extract energy. But also you need to put the externalities which have, have never been included in the equation. So for each of these uh, uh, sources, uh, you should consider the societal impact uh, in terms of uh, air pollution, uh, in terms of accidents uh, uh, and, and so on, uh, deforestation. And this is never done. Uh, and, and I think that uh, this is really what needs to be done uh, according to the principles uh, explained by Andrea Illi, uh, including, for example, circularity. And this is the final slide, which comes from the latest uh, uh, report by IPCC, which shows uh, that we have in front of us uh, different uh, pathways, uh, uh, some of which can lead uh, to disaster uh, <clears throat> in red, uh, where disaster is not only um, floods uh, and uh, wildfires, uh, but also higher poverty because uh, uh, environmental degradation also increases uh, social inequalities, uh, whereas the, the green path uh, is the one that uh, matches the Paris Agreement uh, and uh, is virtuous from many points of view, including uh, social inequalities. Uh, thank you very much. Now I'm trying to stop my... <laughs> this slide is fantastic. Uh, you can keep, <laughs> we can still watch it for uh, four minutes, but thanks very much, Paolo.
for your presentation. I really, I really liked the. Uh, it's, you succeeded in putting all the different part of the puzzles together because there is a link. You show that there is link between health environment, but also to social inequality. And when you said environmental degradation leads also to social inequality, not only to illness, then all part of the puzzles that were all part of the Trieste Declaration, if you want, you know, there is one single puzzle and it's very important, you know, when we touch one part, not to destroy another part, but there are also some parts that can help each other. So thanks very much um, uh, for your presentation. And um, now we, we, we step to another very important part of the duties of the puzzle that it's law and morality. So Kant said that there is a moral law and not only the external law of country. So I would like to ask to the next speaker, to Roberto Escalcilia, who uh, taught a lot about uh, uh, comparative law, the external law, but which is the link between moral duties and legal principles. You have to open up Sorry, your, yes. your, your mic. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much, uh, Raymond, and thank you for this kind invitation. It's an honor for me to participate to this important uh, um, conference. Uh, before um, uh, to give some reflections about my uh, presentation, uh, I won't say that the three uh, um, uh, interventions are very uh, important for me to add to the title of my uh, presentation, Moral Duties and Legal Principle in Context. Because it's not normal that the lawyer, the uh, uh, legal scholars, not all uh, love in context, uh, but um, only the uh, one state or national or provincial law. But this is a good occasion because uh, when we speak about uh, moral duties and legal principle, we uh, are speaking about uh, dualism. And uh, in uh, I, uh, I have three points uh, in my short reflection. Um, two, uh, dualism, right and duty. The second one is moral and legal. And third one is uh, which intersection is possible? Because when we speak about many actors, um, I love very much a consideration by Johan Fox about different actors, because we are in a global system, nation, not in national system, and we have state actors or uh, non-state actors, and also in uh, Andrei uh, inter uh, intervention was uh, uh, this. Uh, important role of different actors. So when we speak about moral duties, a legal principle, uh, we have to consider also the many actors and uh, it's not only uh, the legal rules in, uh, in, in Italy or in other countries or in European or in United States or other countries. Um, when we speak spoke about uh, uh, environment, normally we have idea that the environment was a right, was a right to make all uh, to uh, desertification, to uh, use the water for all, uh, to use the uh, natural resource for our interests. But it's not so, because uh, when we analyze uh, in concrete this duty, there's not a duty uh, in, is not in principle a legal duty, but is also a moral duty, also a religious duty. Um, uh, uh, there was, uh, uh, Raimondo spoke about Dharma, but uh, uh, perhaps in all the religion, we have uh, this point, this duty, uh, environment is a religion, does in, uh, uh, in the Pope Francis, uh, in Laudato Si, this was in uh, also in uh, Islamic religion, this was uh, also in Hindu religion, in many parts, also in the political religion, there is a role for duty. So we have uh, 
uh, we have uh, uh, this principle in ourselves, but we have the way because uh, Johan Fox says we have the way. And uh, for um, for me, it's very important to start in these few minutes uh, from uh, Rita Levi Montalcini when uh, she points out in in this uh, lectio in her lectio magistralis that we need all scientists. Does is not for all comparatist legal scholars, but interdisciplinarity is fundamental because uh, the environment needs all sciences, all also theoretical, more theoretical, more practical, more legal, all because uh, there is a field of collaboration, absolute collaboration. And uh, uh, this one is uh, um, uh, important uh, message to uh, to go beyond frontiers, beyond barriers. It's not possible to uh, discuss about environment without uh, uh, without uh, 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 forget this uh, point of view. When we speak about right and duty, I feel like the, um, uh, all the, 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 the old constitution considers uh, principally um, the environment like a right, but in the new uh, uh, constitution, the, all the, the new uh, um, transformation of the constitution, uh, for example, uh, the best one is a, a French constitution, a French constitution as a charter environment uh, charter, and uh, is uh, uh, really important to give that duties uh, um, um, environment to protect the environment is a part of fundamental rights. It's not possible to separate with law by law uh, uh, environment and constitutional principles because we have a, a structure, constitutional structure in which environment and concept is a context in which power lives uh, is possible to continue. And uh, is really uh, uh, at this moment also uh, Italian constitution in 2021 introduced uh, two modification to articles, um, articles nine and 41, in which for the first time, uh, there are new generations, uh, future, future new generation in a constitution on protect the environment is not only a right, but is a right with limitation, uh, like we uh, can find in Islamic theories, also in, in, also in religion, is right with limitation. So when uh, uh, we accept this concept, right with limitation, we accept that duty as the principal expression of environment protection. This is uh, uh, the first. The second one is moral and uh, legal. Uh, this uh, uh, dualism is uh, classical for, uh, for legal um, philosophers or legal scholar, because the problem is if we have a stairs of norms, uh, perhaps uh, the um, complex legal system uh, uh, is not able to protect all the interest. Because when we consider the environment, not with an object, but like the other, when we speak about under people, uh, the foreigners, the other, so we speak about collaboration, we accept, uh, accept uh, uh, the foreigners, um, we have to respect, uh, we uh, uh, like other person, like other people. And so, uh, for example, uh, the civil system are not uh, not able to resolve this uh, conflict between um, uh, legal norms and ethical norms, universal norms, because where I um, Stufenbau, like Kelsenian words, and uh, so the constitution law and Philae customs, Philae, uh, perhaps, and. Uh, uh, my idea is we have to find an intersection. So which is the way, the best way to, um, uh, uh, to uh, promote uh, this intersection? 
perhaps the, um, I like very much uh, uh, what happens in the common law system when is the judge to promote uh, principles, precautionary principle or to restoration uh, the damages. So it's very important at this moment, dialogue be, uh, between courts, American courts, Australian, Italian, because uh, only with the dialogue between courts is possible to accept the same principle. And uh, when uh, uh, we discuss uh, about the, the, um, the question, why um, in this country they change the rule for the judges? Uh, uh, is there a limitation of uh, uh, freedom of judges? Because uh, that one is uh, in opposition with the dialogue. And when the, the judges dialogue, uh, not only in the state, but together, it's possible to uh, give force to this way, as John Fox uh, at um, in like a picture design. So uh, we have to create an intersection set. It's not possible to de determine this intersection set uh, set uh, by laws or criminal laws or environmental laws. But uh, I think that uh, we have two, um, two uh, possibilities. And uh, the first one is uh, education. Is, uh, uh, I think that uh, we have to promote education in, uh, in every uh, moment from primary school to university. Uh, education, environmental education is the basis for the children to uh, promote uh, these values. And uh, the second one is uh, for that university has an important role for that. And second one is research and innovation. But innovation is innovation to restore, to uh, uh, promote uh, uh, all actions. Uh, and, and in Andre Illy uh, intervention was really define this question. So this is a role, is a role more important for uh, promoting a new vision of these values because it's a real important is these values are in the charter of Trieste. And uh, finally conclude, uh, this article of this uh, um, Trieste declaration, uh, seven to 10, the Tremondo at uh, uh, read before are the basic point to develop a global charter for duties because Trieste Declaration is the principal point, uh, not political, but uh, to transfer in uh, all the people this principle. And university is uh, universities of the world, the schools and are uh, principal actor with the state, with other um, societies, other investment uh, uh, actions, because uh, education uh, is primary for environment. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks very much, Roberto. And while you were thinking and, and telling about uh, the the law and the duties of the future generation, we thought about. A recent uh, the, the recent uh, sentence by the German uh, constitutional court uh, uh, let's say that that said that the German law on climate was not enough ambitious and and what was important is that they they declared that was not enough ambitious for the future generation so the constitutional law in Germany forced the government to set more ambitious climate targets because it is a right of the future generations to have those targets now. I think this is a fantastic example of the link between rights, duties, and future generations. And thanks also for having uh, talked about the future generation, that it's uh, the meaning of sustainable development. Uh, it's exactly to preserve the possibility of future generations to, uh, let's say, to fulfill their expectations and, and, and goals and wishes. Um, so let me introduce now 
on this theme of the responsibility on the responsibility towards younger generation and how much Rita Levi Montalcini consider this theme as crucial and central. Let me introduce the presentation video from Piera Levi Montalcini, president of the Associazione Levi Montalcini. Can you please launch the video? Thanks. Buongiorno, buon pomeriggio a tutti. Grazie a tutti voi che siete qui presenti anche per ricordare Zia Rita. Eh, è questa un'impresa a cui mi dedico ormai da dieci anni in cui ho bisogno dell'aiuto di tutti. Eh, vorrei che Zia Rita fosse ricordata perché eh, veramente ha lasciato un segno eh, nella storia e ha lasciato un segno eh, nel modo di insegnare ai ragazzi, insegnare ai ragazzi parlando loro semplicemente e eh, cercando di trasmettere loro quelli che sono eh, i capisaldi del, dei nostri, del nostro modo di vivere e del rispetto tra le persone. Eh, penso che avesse un, una capacità di, eh, di, di influenzare le persone eh, veramente eh, al di sopra della media e eh, tutto quello che eh, ci ha lasciato è degno di essere eh, ridiscusso e eh, rammodernato ma eh, comunque eh, tramandato e eh, messo alla base dell'insegnamento verso i ragazzi. Con la carta dei doveri umani eh, lei eh, voleva dirci e eh, dire soprattutto ai ragazzi che eh, siamo tendenzialmente propensi a eh, parlare dei nostri diritti ma eh, molto propensi a dimenticarci dei nostri doveri. Questo l'ha detto espressamente eh, nella sua Lecce Magistralis in occasione della laurea honoris causa che ha avuto a Trieste, eh, ha proprio detto eh, noi parliamo di diritti ma eh, di doveri ce ne dimentichiamo. Di qui eh, dal, dal 1991 secondo me incomincia eh, la vita eh, più in contatto con i giovani della zia. Eh, in fondo lei diceva che l'insegnamento eh, l'aveva sempre giudicato prima un momento di distrazione dalla ricerca che eh, le interessava di più e che eh, la appassionava eh, tantissimo e quindi eh, dover interrompere per andare a insegnare era eh, per lei una sofferenza. Ne, dal, da dopo il Nobel invece questo diventa il suo, eh, la sua missione, la, quello che la, la appassiona di più e eh, il fatto di poter parlare di quelle che era stata la sua esperienza e la sua vita e di poter eh, comunicare e tramandare quello che eh, i suoi genitori le avevano insegnato era diventata eh, la sua missione fondamentale. Eh, subito dopo la Carta dei Doveri Umani, infatti, istituisce la Fondazione Levi Montalcini che si propone di aiutare i ragazzi a scegliere eh, la propria strada, eh, a, a trovare il proprio talento e a pensare che eh, quello che mh, potrebbe essere visto solo come un hobby può sempre diventare un lavoro, un lavoro che appassiona. Quindi eh, di qui eh, l'opera che viene lasciata ai centri di orientamento e successivamente eh, passa poi eh, a me eh, nel mio lavoro. Eh, io oggi mh, quando vado nelle scuole parlo sempre della carta dei doveri umani. Mi sembra che sia indispensabile eh, ribadire ai ragazzi che anche eh, con eh, il rispetto, anzi solo attraverso il rispetto dei propri doveri, eh, si può vivere e convivere in maniera pacifica e in maniera eh, anche proficua e eh, utile. 
eh, per noi che andiamo nelle scuole eh, la carta dei doveri eh, ci riporta sempre a combattere il bullismo e a combattere tutte, le forze, tutte quelle eh, forme di sopraffazione che oggi purtroppo eh, si eh, esplicano eh, in maniera differente da allora ma che sono altrettanto dannose e altrettanto eh, nefaste. Molte volte infatti vediamo ragazzi vittime di bullismo arrivare addirittura al suicidio oppure eh, avere dei traumi da cui difficilmente riescono a salvarsi. Eh, con la carta dei doveri il primo, eh, il primo punto, eh, che è quello del rispetto della dignità umana, eh, è eh, il più importante e eh, il, infatti è il primo. Proprio la dignità degli altri va eh, rispettata e eh, ovviamente questo insegnamento arriva da una persona che ha subito proprio il non rispetto della dignità umana. Eh, le persecuzioni l'hanno vista eh, scappare, nascondersi e rischiare la vita più di una volta, per cui eh, eh, questo, eh, quello che lei ha vissuto eh, non voleva che fosse vissuto da, eh, da altri. Vi ringrazio per, per l'aiuto che mi state dando e mi auguro che eh, questo aiuto continui. Eh, per me è un lavoro eh, incessante, è un lavoro eh, anche talvolta difficile, eh, ma è un lavoro eh, a cui mi sento eh, chiamata eh, quasi, eh, diciamo, per... Eh, eh, per chiamata, come si suol dire, eh, nel senso che eh, penso che quello che la zia ha voluto tramandare eh, sia mio dovere fare in modo eh, che venga eh, tramandato e che venga eh, recepito dalle giovani generazioni. Grazie uh, much. I would like um to thank piera for these very nice uh, words and also these very nice uh images and we would like to help um at work uh, personally i find very interesting the idea of uh letting you know children and students to know more about the duties sometimes it's very difficult to link the duties to something sweet and not bitter so the idea is how to Uh, how to demonstrate that to follow some duties uh, is something that pays off and can give you also happiness in return. It's very, very interesting work. Uh, we're getting to the conclusions, uh, but before asking uh, Sergio Pauletti uh, to, to make some conclusions and maybe to tell us about next steps, uh, let's make a joke together, but even more than a joke. Let me, let's make an exercise. I, I thought Well, listening to all this speech and, and all these ideas that, um, you know, the, the, the birthdays and the, and, and the important um, days are very good and they are very um, useful to make aspirations or commitments. So I would ask all of us connected and myself as a moderator to think about one action, one action today that is the Earth Day one duty, one commitment, one action that we could make in reality to improve the condition of the earth. It can be small, but it, it, it can be big, but something that we can do during the next months, maybe in, in 2022. Something that we can do, that maybe we wanted to do, and now it's time to, to do it and to focus our energies to, to make it. Let's think about this and maybe let's do it. This will be something very, very useful. But this is only the first exercise. And the second exercise, I will ask this to the speakers. If they are all still connected, I hope so. I would ask them to tell us, in their opinion, which is the most important or urgent or feasible duty and commitment action that should be done in their field of activity, in their opinion, which can be the top priority in their opinion. So let's start from Johan.
Okay, thank you. That's a tough question and not so simple as you said. Um, I think one commitment um, that we can make on a daily basis uh, is to think that what, can I, what I can do personally, in my profession, in my business, in my um, living habits, um, while thinking, what do I owe to future generations? And I think everything follows from that. Protecting the planet, trying to aim for peace between peoples, and, uh, I, and helping people who are less advantage than we are. Um, what do we owe to future generations? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Andrea, uh, from your perspective uh, of a company, of business, and of uh, stuff for the regenerative model, which is the, can you pick up one priority? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, very good. <laughs> Difficult question as well. Uh, I think, um, first of all, we need to build awareness that this is not uh, an option. Uh, it's an imperative. And so that uh, we have a planetary call to action, but not in by words, by action. We need now to start impacting. Uh, reducing uh, dramatically carb greenhouse gases emissions, uh, uh, stopping, uh, you know, using land, you, and uh, stopping this degradation of the environment. This all starts from our behavior, as I try to say. Uh, nature will be able to regenerate it itself on, in, on its own spontaneously, should only human beings stopping polluting. This is what we need. And uh, I think it's also, uh, besides education is about the media. I see with the interest that there are some uh, interesting uh, entertainment uh, programs uh, centered around the sustainability. This I think is the right way to go in order to build uh, some uh, uh, social awareness, even from uh, people who are not involved directly uh, in, uh, in, in uh, in a business activity. Thanks very much. Paolo. Yes. Well, I think I have a, a, a simple and clear answer, which is we desperately need an international organization that takes care of all these uh, problems uh, because we, we have seen uh, the weakness of uh, uh, organizations and, and states uh, in front of COVID-19. And uh, I'm afraid we are not talking about a preparedness uh, to future pandemics. Uh, in general, I, I see a lot of weakness uh, on the side of uh, the United Nations. Uh, though they uh, sponsor uh, the COPs, uh, COPs, and uh, also IPCC, this is not enough because, because it's not uh, politically compelling. Uh, so I, I see the, the strong need for an international organization that uh, uh, becomes uh, sufficiently strong to uh, oblige uh, the, the states uh, <clears throat> to, to uh, put in place uh, uh, all the, need, the measures that are needed to uh, contrast the climate change and the environmental degradation in cooperation with, uh, uh, with the business world, uh, with uh, industrialists. Uh, and uh, uh, well, that's a completely different uh, topic and Andrea already mentioned it, uh, but uh, we, we have to cooperate with the, I would say, the good business uh, uh, against uh, the bad business. Thanks very much, Paolo. And then Roberto for the final priority. Microphone. Um, the, uh, that is a difficult question, but I think that uh, we have uh, two different levels, a general level. So we have to contrast pollution, to have to promote uh, new ideas. But I think the solution is uh, also everyday life for all the peoples. Uh, I can explain to my students that uh, 
uh, is really important, the duties. I, am, I was a professor comparing constitutional law. Duty, uh, duties are more important than rights at this moment. And then every, in everyday life, what I can lose, what I can leave to the other, what I, uh, um, I is gift, uh, uh, there is my renunciation, what I have ready to give to the other. That one uh, is uh, uh, respect for myself, respect for the other. And so we can have uh, important program, but, uh, uh, but when the judges give an uh, interpretation not correct with this principle, uh, the legal question are not oriented to this principle because normal in, in, uh, um, in all uh, tribunals or in the courts, right, right, right. But we have to begin to discuss for this perspective of Rita Levi Montalcini, but we have to discuss by ourselves first. And then at general level, because general level is prescriptive or not, or uh, is uh, a declaration. But we want the Trieste uh, declaration uh, begin uh, every day more consistent for all, for the children, for the young uh, to give uh, uh, for the next generation uh, to, to start in this moment to protect the environment for the future. Uh, I think that every man, every woman, every human beings must uh, give something for that. Thanks very much. Thanks to all the speakers and uh, Sergio, we, we are now concluding the conference and I have to ask you, which is your perception, which is your feeling and your and your feedback about uh, what we discuss. I think that we open up many doors and, and each of these doors has maybe can be uh, the center and the content for one single conference in the future. So uh, what is your perception? How can you conclude this uh, online conference? Thank you. Uh, I think in a way, uh, it's not a joke, it's no conclusion. It's just one step forward. If you allow me, I would just quote from uh, Rita's talk in 91, this uh, Lectio Magistralis. She said, both humanistic culture and spiritual and religious experiences are including in this system expressing not so differently Schweitzer's principles of reverence for life. Moreover, she said that believing that composing a bill of duties suffices to solve the huge problems mankind is called to face nowadays would be a utopia. Nonetheless, scientists duly supported by rulers must develop this project. So really, I, um, in a way, I would say that on the birthday of Rita de Montalcini, today's meeting has been really demonstration of what she was uh, proposing and uh, really with a far looking view. Uh, we heard very, very exciting uh, contribution from different points of view, which is multiculturality and multidisciplinarity. And um, this is the way uh, to solution. Of course, the uh, the contribution by, by Piera, Levi Montalcini, is in a way uh, should be a kind of, of uh, light for future activities. I believe, I personally believe that the young generations are the, the first target. Of course, we need to change ourselves. We need, above all, try to change political, social, economic institution, otherwise nothing will change. But also, I believe, I do believe that the younger generation must be persuaded of that. I personally uh, had the opportunity and the honor to be together with Rita in several instances where she met even thousands of young people. And believe me, uh, they were so motivated. In any meeting, I found that the young generation really 
are expecting from everybody, from grown up people, from scientists, they are expecting us to talk, to talk loud. So this is the meeting, uh, this is the, the, I think the message, the take home message from the meeting today. And I think in everyday life for everybody, this should be the guideline. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sergio. And I would like to thank all the speakers and to all participants who are uh, connected. I would like to thank you all on behalf of the International Council of Human Duties and Regenerative Society Foundation. I will also thank the Fondazione uh, CL Trieste uh, for the support. And uh, I think we, all, as we say, we open up a path and maybe I would like to meet all of you again in our next uh, conference or in the next conference about this and we follow up with our action with our commitments with our duties and, and we have done this on the earth day and on the birthday of Rita Levi-Montalcini. Thank you everybody and bye-bye. <laughs>